tonight we're continuing our series on the book of Joel. And it's been a bit of a tough slog, a bit of a heavy book to, uh, to get through. Uh, we've been working our way through a story that's all about lament, uh, this mourning of the disturbance of the way things once were, the way things ought to be. Uh, last week, Byron took us through the first part of chapter two, uh, and he reminded us that this process of refinement, this preparation for the day of the Lord, it's, it's not pleasant. There's, in order for justice to be served, quite often pain needs to be felt. But there's hope, though, as Byron reminded us. Everything that stands in opposition to God will be burnt away. Everything that uh, does stand for God, that is on his side, will endure. So that's the hope that we have there. So that's the context that we have as we come to our passage this evening. And if you're taking notes, there's two words to take away. Uh, and these are the headings of our two sections. Repent and react. So, repent. Starting in verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Even now. The Israelites had been through an incredibly difficult time. Every trace of food and sustenance had disappeared into the mouths of ravenous locusts. The land can no longer produce crops. It can't even support future crops. The people's ability to offer sacrifices, that connection with God, that's been disconnected. It looks like a hopeless situation. But look at the text. Even now. Even now, in the midst of their pain and suffering, God calls to the people. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, he says. God calls the Israelites to turn back to him, repenting. That is, turning away from their sins and towards God. But this repentance has to be complete. They have to be all in. As Calvin commented, moderate repentance will not do. And so indeed, the next part of the passage tells us how complete and transformative this change needs to be. Looking at verse 13. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. This repentance, this turning back to God, it can't just be at surface level. It is meant to come from the heart. It's meant to be genuine. God is effectively saying in this verse, if you're turning to me, it has to be authentic. It has to be complete. Now, I wonder how many of you have seen the show Breaking Bad. I've got to be careful with this example, I suppose. <laughs> uh, there's a scene where Walter White, the main character, is talking to Mike Ehrmantraut, the, the gun, gun for hire of sorts. And Mike says to Walter, talking about not leaving unfinished business, he says, no half measures. Now, Walter has to be all in, leaving nothing behind in his activities. Now, very different context here, I'll give you that. But the same kind of half measures, like uh, that's what we're talking about here. We have to be all in when we're talking about repentance. The words in verse 13, rend your heart, they give us this idea that when we turn back to God, in repentance, when we turn away from our sins, it has to be a complete commitment. We can't be looking back over our shoulders at the sin that we left behind. Now, the commentary that I referenced here puts it as ritual repentance, however fervently carried out, uh, is of no use if the heart is unchanged. So that prompts the next question. If we're turning away from our sin, who or what are we turning towards? The next part of the verse tells us, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. 
and he relents from sending calamity. Now, the Old Testament frequently makes uh, reference to the, describes God as gracious and compassionate. There's a good reason for it. It's the same language that he used in Exodus when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He said there, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That part of Exodus goes on to describe the second chance that God gave the people, uh, that he would be their God and they would be his people. And God is indeed the God of second chances. Whenever we mess up, whenever we don't even keep the standard that we set for ourselves, we might be tempted to sit in hopelessness and wonder, how can I ever come back from this? How can I ever get through this? How can I ever improve? Do we ever look at our failings, a sin, and wonder, surely what I've done or failed to do is so bad that God could never possibly forgive me, much less love me? But remember those words, abounding in love. There's a reason why they're so often repeated throughout the Bible. God is slow to anger, abounding in love. He relents, he holds back from sending disaster. So we can be absolutely confident that God wants us to draw near to him when things get tough because he really does love us. Look at verse 6 of our New Testament reading from 1 Corinthians. God comforts the downcast. That's the same God who calls us to follow us, follow him through Jesus. My prayer is that each and every one of us would come to understand how wide, how long, how deep that love is for each and every one of us. Now the passage continues in verse 14. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Now there's a couple of things to unpack here. Firstly, who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Is, is the author here asking or saying, I'm not sure if God will stop this plague of locusts. I'm not sure if we're going to get through this. I don't think so. I think there's, there's more at play here. And I think this verse links with the previous one in, in verse 13, the call for genuine repentance. Uh, maybe a different way of writing this verse might be to say, when we repent wholeheartedly, when we give everything over to God and start doing things his way, maybe then we'll get through it. The underlying point that Joel seems to be making here is that God is always free to act as he chooses. And perhaps his pulling back from sending this disaster will achieve a higher purpose. Now that has implications for us too. Uh, when, we return, when we repent, when we turn back to God, and we turn away from everything that opposes God uh, and turn to him, we submit ourselves to his will, not our own. When we bring prayers and petitions to him, it's not in the hope that we would bend God's will to fit our intentions, but that we would be moulded and changed to fall humbly under his will. Now, this, this can be uncomfortable, and it's meant to be. Where there's a, a dissonance between what we want to do and what God wants us to do, there will always be a challenge to humble ourselves and submit to God. Well, we can't do that on our own. Uh, so when we do face those difficult situations where we have a choice between doing our thing and God's thing, we always need to pray and ask God to help us get through that specific situation. But secondly, notice the, the blessing that Joel hopes will come about as a result of the people's humility towards God back in the passage. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Now remember back from chapter 1 and verse 9, where it says, Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. At that time, things were so desolate, so the land so barren, that there wasn't even enough to do the sacrifices, to uh, do the things that connected the people to God. 
Joel is outlining that the hope that with this repentance, with the people seeking God earnestly, uh, that he would reach out to them and restore the relationship. This is a testament to God's character. He reaches out in kindness to us, to restore us. He made the way back to himself through Jesus. And all we need to do is take hold of that, live by faith, repenting when we get it wrong and seeking God in order to continually become more and more like Jesus. So that's the first part. Let's look at the second part, react. We get to verse 15, and this is where the people are called upon to react to their, to their repentance. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Now, it's one thing to say that we turn away from our sins, but how do we show that it's genuine? In our passage, Joel calls the people together in a public service of lamentation. It's the same kind of meeting that occurred uh, in 2 Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 20. Uh, the Am Moabites and Ammonites and their allies came to wage war against Judah. And in response from verse 4 of that chapter... The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Uh, later in that passage, in that chapter, verse 15, God says to them, do not, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Back in Joel, the people were called together to seek God's help. Gather the people, consecrate the assembly, Bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom lead his, leave his room and the bride her chamber. This meeting was to be a priority for everyone. The elders, the leaders of the community, the children, those who were next in line to leave, the babies, even newlyweds on their honeymoon. This had to be a priority for everyone. Why? Because the situation was so severe, so serious, that it needed everyone to humble themselves before God and petition him to hold off the disaster at hand. Again, not so that they could manipulate or mould God's will to theirs, but to demonstrate to him that their individual and corporate will was in line with his will. This return to God, this repentance needed to involve everyone. And in verse 17, let the priests who minister before the Lord weep before the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? The priests had an important role here, and that was to hold the weight of the individual and collective repentance of the people and take it to God. The priests appealed to God's kindness and mercy, and they reminded him of the covenant, that promise that he had made that time ago to be their God and for them to be uh, his people. And that's what this word inheritance means, uh, the people who belonged to God. The priests, in a way, are calling for God to, to save face. Not only for the people's sake, but for God's sake uh, and his own reputation. Perhaps another way of uh, saying verse 17, the priests might be saying to God, rescue us from the locusts so that we would have something left with which to worship you. And the nations around us will see that you are powerful and able to save your people. So what does this passage mean for us? Well, we're all going to face difficult times. Some of us might be in the middle of those difficult times at the moment. The situations might be of our own making. Or they might come about as a result of somebody else's actions. Or there might be no reason at all why we're in these situations. 
after all, in uh, Joel, we're not told exactly what caused God to send the locusts. We're only told what to do in response. And that is to humble ourselves before God. This repentance, this turning back to God, it's not pleasant, as Byron reminded us last week. Because it's the death of ourselves and the taking on of God's character. This call to repentance might come from those around us who love us enough to point us to Jesus. And Paul outlined this this in our 2 Corinthians passage from verse 3. He said, I do not say this to condemn you. I've said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. I've spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I'm greatly encouraged. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. And later in verse 8, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy. Not because you were made sorrow, sorry, but your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. That's what our struggles ought to produce. Godly character flowing from genuine repentance. And this leads us to want the same for those around us. We love because God first loved us. We've seen the Lord, so we want others to see him too. In Joel, the people are in a situation that doesn't just look hopeless, it is hopeless. They could have wallowed in sorrow, as we see so often in the, in the Bible. But instead, they humbled themselves before God and appealed to his character of love, patience and kindness. And in a couple of weeks, take a break next week from Joel, uh, we'll see God's response. Spoiler alert. God doesn't just let his people languish and starve. He reaches down to them through the prophet Joel and calls his people back to himself. God knows that his people are hurting and he deeply, deeply cares about that. He's also calling us to return to him. We might feel that we've wandered too far from God to come back. But this passage gives us hope. We can turn around and put our hope and trust in Jesus. So I encourage you, if you're in a difficult position, or even if you're doing just fine, if you haven't yet put your trust in Jesus, please do this. It's a priority. Don't hesitate because God is generous. He loves you. And the sooner you turn to follow him in Jesus, the sooner you'll get to experience the knowledge of that love and generosity. So if you haven't worked it out yet, you're welcome to. Talk to Red, Tim, Byron, or a Christian nearby about how to put your trust in Jesus. So let's pray.